Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum, the leading authority on cyber, information security, and risk management. I'm Tavia Gilbert, and I'm glad to welcome you back to another cutting-edge conversation tailored to CISOs, CTOs, CROs, and other global security pros. In every episode of ISF's media, CEO Steve Durbin speaks with rule breakers, collaborators, culture builders, and business creatives who manage their enterprise with vision, transparency, authenticity, and integrity. And he brings that conversation to you, your teams, and your partners. Today, we bring you a conversation with Steve and Harvard professor, social psychologist, philosopher, and scholar Shoshana Zuboff. Professor Zuboff is the author of three influential books on tech and society. And in this episode, she speaks about the themes in her latest book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. She spoke with Steve late last year before the U.S. presidential election about the new economic order that claims human experience is free raw material for commercial practices, as well as the expanding attack surface for digital information warfare, and more. The age of surveillance capitalism. It's a, some would say, insightful, others would say frightening. A real walkthrough in terms of a lot of the things that you touched on there. I think a couple of things that jumped out at me. You talk about this new economic order that claims human experience is a free raw material for hidden commercial practices, for instance, for extraction, prediction and sales. You've also talked about expanding the attack surface for digital information warfare, predictions of human behavior. Now, what does that mean for the future? What does the future hold for the individual in such an environment? And perhaps much more importantly, what can we actually do about it? This is a very big question. So let me try to highlight some of the key elements of an answer. Imagine that it was uh, December 31st, 1999. And we're looking back at a 20th century where there was never any child labor legislation and there was never any rights legislation that gave people, for example, the right to join a trade union or bargain collectively or the right to strike. We're looking back at a century, let's imagine, where there were never any laws about fair working practices, about fair wages never any laws that institutionalize consumer rights, our rights to food that is safe and medicine that is safe, no laws that ever institutionalize any protections for environment or for health provisions, health insurance and uh, health safety nets, retirement safety nets and social security and other kinds of systems that our countries have put into place. In short, we would be looking back at a century without any of the institutions from consumer protection to environmental protection to protection of financial interactions and all the rest. We would be looking back at a century where industrial capitalism had been allowed to grow and dominate with its rapacious power and individuals, citizens had virtually no power to protect themselves against its excesses. Which is to say we would be looking back at a 20th century of extreme oligarchy and serfdom where there would have been very little mass education, where there would have been no middle class, a very different world than the world that we thankfully have inherited from the 20th century. Why am I asking you to go through this thought experiment? Because right now, in the year 2020, we are entering the third decade of the digital century in that kind of situation, marching naked into this digital century without the charters of rights, the legal frameworks, the regulatory paradigms, the institutional forms that we need to make this century safe for democracy, to make this a century where we can look forward 
to a digital future that is compatible with democracy, compatible with the aspirations of a democratic people. And I say this to you in a great sense of urgency, because if we look around the world, we see that the liberal democracies have failed to undertake this work of legal and institutional creativity. But that is not true for all countries. The Chinese, for example, at least since 2010, have been intentionally designing a digital future that advances the prospects of an authoritarian state, as in the mold of the Chinese Communist Party. And this has become a hallmark not only of their domestic policy, but also of their foreign policy. We know of at least 36 countries where they have exported not only surveillance technology, but the cadres of teams sent to train local officials in how to deploy such technology uh, in order to advance the aims of an authoritarian state. So here we have one version of a digital future actively under construction, which is antithetic and at war essentially with our aims as liberal democracies. And we have the liberal democracies right now having left a void where this work must occur. So the answer to your question is that without law, without new charters of rights and new legal frameworks and new institutions, we do not have protections from these operations that I have described to you. In my view, a company like Facebook or any other company, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, the leading surveillance capitalists, as well as the hundreds and thousands of companies that constitute their complex ecosystems, they have no right to take our experience. That is a fundamental act of theft, and these huge financial behemoths are built on the shifting sands of illegitimacy. But at this point in time, as sovereign individuals and citizens of democratic societies, we do not have the rights that protect our experience from this kind of unilateral and secret extraction. I call these epistemic rights, rights about knowledge. Who gets to know my experience? Who decides who gets to know my experience? The answers to those questions have always been, well, I know and I decide because there was never any other capability of, of somebody to secretly take my face, translate it into my emotional state and use that to predict my behavior as is commonly done today. That, that simply didn't exist. So we're in a new world. It's a digital world. The digital infrastructure has been commanded for this work of economies of action. Uh, this is what I call instrumentarian power, using this power to influence and shape our behavior, not in a way that threatens murder or violence, but that works through this thick infrastructure of digital instrumentation to touch us from afar, but nevertheless to do so extremely effectively. So we have a lot of work to do. That's kind of the downside, but the upside is our societies as democracies have engaged in this kind of work before. We've done it before, we can do it again. There is a tremendous amount of evidence that our lawmakers and our publics are already mobilized in this direction. And I have every optimism that we will see the third decade as the time when finally these activities are contested, constrained, interrupted, and even outlawed. I think that's a very interesting perspective. I think I come back to you in two areas. The first would be a very simple question. Do you believe that our politicians, our legislators, are actually equipped to compete with some of the things you've been talking about, some of the advances that we're seeing the technology companies implement because it seems to me that in the absence of these rights we have to fall back on say governments or legislators to come up with these things and my question is are they equipped to do it well the answer is yes they are equipped to do it because they have the one thing that the surveillance capitalists 
actually fear. They have democracy. They have law. And from all of these years of study, Steve, I have concluded that, you know, every great power has an Achilles heel. And even the unaccountable, currently unaccountable power of these massive corporations has an Achilles heel, and that Achilles heel is law. That is why they are the most powerful lobbyists and spend more money on lobbying than any other corporations ever. That is why they will fight tooth and nail to prevent every kind of new regulation and every kind of law in the UK, in the EU, in the United States, and in every country. And not only in the United States on a federal basis, but they drill down into every state, every state legislature, and they put their lobbyists to work to contest every single law, just as we're seeing right now in California, which is about to vote on a referendum for a more comprehensive privacy law. And of course, the companies are arrayed there to fight it tooth and nail. Law is their enemy. Democracy is their enemy. Democracy is slow. The companies are fast, but democracy is powerful and ultimately more powerful than the companies because they must exist under the rule of law. Now, there's one thing that lawmakers need, and uh, we've touched on this a little bit. They need the public. They need the public, Steve. They need to feel the public at their backs. And this is another kind of uh, symbiosis, if you will. Lawmakers and the public need to be collaborating and working together. We are starting to see that. And I am really, really, really struck. There's one thing I just wanted to share with you super quickly. You know, when pandemic hit and we all went remote the way we are remote right now, the word on the street was, oh, the tech lash is over. Now everybody's going to love tech and, you know, tech is stepping up to be our friends and we're all on the, you know, remote, we're all on the screen, we're working, we're going to school, we're doing everything by the screen. And this is going to show the world that people and tech really are in love after all. Well, I said from the beginning that that was not true, that the opposite was going to happen. It was going to spread the tech lash and either remind us or demonstrate to many more people on our planet right now how pernicious these systems really are. And that is indeed what has happened. I want to just read you a very quick highlight from, this is a U.S. poll, and it's a poll of U.S. voters, but it's a poll that was conducted very recently. And this poll took an overview of attitudes toward the tech sector, but it also drilled down into attitudes toward Facebook. And what it showed is that right now, robust majorities of voters, and that means in the 50s, 60s, 70s, sometimes even higher percentiles, 80s and 90s, robust majorities think that Facebook divides rather than unites communities, does more harm than good, elevates bad actors and toxic content, fails to combat racism, prioritizes profit over societal harm. There is nearly universal support, I think it's 93%, to subjecting politicians to the same fact-checking as everyone else, which is a policy that Mr. Zuckerberg has rejected, while 83% support banning false political ads and 83% support restricting the use of personal data for political ad targeting, as we saw in the case of the Trump campaign in 2016, suppressing the black vote. 85% agree that the tech companies have too much power with Facebook ranked as number one and the only industry or person that ranks lower than Facebook and Mr. Zuckerberg in all of this is the tobacco industry. It is a wholesale rupture of public opinion with the tech sector and Facebook in particular. And this, I think, talks to us about our future, Steve, because it shows that the public has outrun law right now. 
And so this is the opportunity and our lawmakers are already perceiving this, whether we talk about lawmakers on the frontier in the UK with the new digital rights initiatives that are going on in the UK and other things that are coming out of parliament right now with the initiatives that are coming out of the EC and the EC leadership and the EU. And in America, where we finally have some antitrust activities underway, as well as at least 26 important bills over the past year, which specifically address some or another aspect of surveillance capitalism itself, whether it's disinformation or filter bubbles, various aspects of these mechanisms and methods that I've been describing to you, including proposals for a full-time enforcement-enabled dedicated privacy agency to become the hub of these efforts in our country, something which would be a huge step forward, obviously, in the U.S. So these things are on the move, and that is why I am optimistic that they will happen. But let me put to you a contrarian view here. So uh, you've just very eloquently explained all of these polls and this mood. I'm just sitting here thinking, well, presumably Google and Facebook know that already. And presumably, because they have been very active in terms of, as you refer to it, surveillance capitalism, they're already taking steps, one would assume, to combat some of this. Would you agree with that? Is that something else that we need to be afraid of, that they're always going to be one step ahead? Well, what you're referring to is taking steps to continue to hide. There are two ways that they hide. One is the technical operations themselves are hidden and you need fairly intense forensics in order to unveil these operations. So I assume you're referring to that. The other way that they hide, and this is terribly important for us to understand, is they hide through rhetoric. You're familiar with the term gaslighting. They have developed rhetorical strategies over the last two decades, which can most easily be referred to as gaslighting. The idea that they say that X is happening when actually something over here in the realm of uh, A, B, or C is happening, <laughs> and there is no overlap between the two. And they do this constantly, and they do it with a straight face. And it's really hard to know where the truth lies. So in a way, they themselves are skilled in the arts of disinformation, and that is another way that they hide. So yes, of course they are going to keep doing that. But what I'm talking about is we are going to have to aim at lawmaking that goes directly to the heart of these mechanisms so that there is no longer uh, lawful, for example, psychological micro-targeting. Things that can be not only monitored, but enforced. We're talking about, for example, eliminating the financial incentives that accrue to these operations. I've described to you these human futures markets that trade exclusively in these predictions. This is the heart of the financial incentives that drive the entire operation. Now, if we were, for example, to say that trading in human futures is um, inherently a threat to democracy, uh, inherently pernicious, it's a threat to democracy in two ways because it produces these economies of action which threaten democracy from below because they are an assault on human autonomy and decision rights and individual sovereignty without which a democratic society is unimaginable, but also a threat to democracy from above because it is these dynamics that produce the unprecedented concentrations of knowledge and power at precisely the moment when we entered this digital century, expecting it to be the golden age of democracy, the flourishing of the democratization of knowledge. But instead we find ourselves reverting to this kind of feudal pattern where a small elite has massive control over unimaginable concentrations of knowledge and power. Concentrations, mind you, not only of wealth, not only of economic power, but of knowledge and the power that accrues to that knowledge. All right, so if we were to make 
these kinds of markets illegal, for example, the way we have made markets in human organs illegal or markets in human beings illegal. We've made those kinds of markets illegal because we believe they are anti-democratic and reliably dangerous. And we could do the same thing with human futures markets. So I'm talking about our ability in time as this discussion evolves to not only create the new charters of rights that we need, as we did in the 20th century, Steve, but also to create those laws and constraints that will fundamentally change the name of the game. The good news here is that it takes only a little bit of this interruption and outlawing to completely transform the competitive landscape. The real crime for society here is that we need the digital. We need the digital to solve real problems in the lives of real people. We need the digital to tackle our most pressing problems as societies, whether it's solving the many forms of cancer or whether it's solving climate crisis or whether it's putting into play all over the world hundreds of millions of brilliant and loving teachers and doctors who are the real solutions for most of our problems. But we are not using the digital to do any of this, Steve. We are using the digital. Most of the information that inhabits that domain comes from us without our permission, but it is not used for us. It is about us, but it is shunted into a narrow marketplace that is used to further others' aims. So there is this huge disconnect right now between supply and demand. In the long arc of economic history, demand always wins. Supply must be eventually subject to demand. And that is why, you know, capitalism has been so successful over the centuries, because it finds ways to accommodate to people. It has found ways to allow itself to be tethered to democracy and to the idea of creating inclusive prosperity and lifting all boats. And this is the history of the democratic middle class. So I believe that once we start to throw some constraints into the mix here, we have so many entrepreneurs waiting in the wings. We have so many businesses waiting in the wings that want to be successful digitally without having to produce the surveillance dividend without having to produce the profits that are the exclusive fruit of this parasitic kind of economic logic that account for most of the profit, revenue, and market capitalization of the big companies in this economic logic like Facebook and Google, but also many, many more. So a challenge undoubtedly for all of us, but a glimmer of hope at the end of it all is what I'm hearing you say, Shoshana. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much indeed for sharing some of those very valuable insights. I'm sure that our members will have found that certainly food for thought as indeed I have. So Shoshana Zuboff, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Steve. It's wonderful to end on a hopeful note that another future is possible one in which we enjoy no less entrepreneurship, creativity, or service, but where we are free from the harms of the surveillance dividend. In our next episode, Steve speaks with Dr. Kate Stone, a creative scientist whose company Novalia blends art and science to create fusions of new and old technology. Dr. Stone talks to Steve about her creative process, the role of analog in the digital age, data privacy, and more. Can we actually start to think, do we really need to store that information? Do we really need to gather that information? Is it pertinent to what we're doing? Because, you know, once it's seen, it can't be unseen. Collecting everything, storing everything, and making everything public isn't necessarily the right thing to do. We need to make that information a little more scarce. And gathering everything, making everything available is frictionless. There needs to be some friction built into that. We look forward to bringing you the full conversation. 
In the meantime, we invite you to tune into our catalog of video and podcast episodes, all of which you can find at securityforum.org. We invite you to subscribe to the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd be so grateful if you'd recommend us. Growing our subscriber numbers helps us reach new audiences and helps us continue to bring you these timely discussions. You can always join in the conversation on our LinkedIn page or get in touch directly through our website, where you can also download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer, Katie Flood. Mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.